Um, thank you, Sarah. She actually pronounced my name right, which for most of you, if you look at my name, nobody gets that right, so she gets um, super cred for that, for getting it right. Um, I did tell her, and she's like, no, that's what I would have said. And I said, really? Because most people don't ever say that. Tania, Tania, Tanya. So tonight we're going to talk about HIV, and one of the things I want to do is combat some of the misconceptions. I'm actually still amazed and surprised when I ask people about their knowledge levels regarding HIV and HIV transmission that people still have a lot of misconceptions about it. And we also know as people are able to increase their knowledge, they decrease their stigma. So that's one of the things we're going to do tonight. But then the most of the evening is going to be spent around looking at the implications with the drug use epidemic and here in Appalachia specifically, what is happening here or what could happen in the future. So let's talk about HIV. But first, a little bit about me, and I guess I don't need this because I can actually reach the screen, which doesn't always happen. So a little bit about me, if you're wondering how I got here, I did my Master of Public Health at Indiana University in Bloomington in Community Health Education and graduated in 2003. That wasn't enough, so I went straight on for my PhD at the University of Georgia in Health Promotion and Behavior. And then immediately, two weeks later after graduation, started here. So I have now been here for 12 years, which is hard to believe that I started in 06. And I'm an associate professor in community and public health and the chair of social and public health. And my research interests, sexual health broadly defined mostly in the context of HIV and HIV prevention, used to be among increasing quality of life among people who are positive. But when I moved to southeastern Ohio, I found there weren't very many people living here who are HIV positive. So I quickly changed my research to focus more on prevention. And just a disclosure, I am not an MD or a DO, so please don't ask me treatment questions or things that are very basic science level because I won't be able to answer them. I'm a social and behavioral researcher and I can talk about people. So that's what we're gonna talk about. So first of all, I better talk about what is HIV and what is AIDS. And these definitions have actually changed over the years. So if you learned about them in the early 80s, some of you were around in the early 80s. Um, so some of you might remember the HIV epidemic. For those of you who have were born a lot later, um, definitions changed in the 90s. So first of all, HIV is the human immunodeficiency virus, right? HIV is the virus that causes AIDS. And so initially, and most people don't know when they're infected, right? It's not like you're then sent an email or, or a text like, hey, by the way, you were just infected with HIV. That would make this really easy. Most people don't know when they've been infected. So if you do know, if you're a healthcare worker and you have a needle stick, that within the first two to four weeks is what's the acute infection. And acute infection is basically when you have flu-like symptoms where your body's trying to fight off the virus but it can't fight off the virus. So you're gonna have fever and muscle aches, and a lot of people just may think they're sick. They have no idea that it's actually acute infection. And that lasts a really short period of time, and then you feel healthy again, so you think, I must be fine. But HIV can then go into an asymptomatic or latent phase for up to 10 years. So you don't show symptoms of the virus, you're healthy, everything's going great, you may not get tested, you may not know you're HIV positive, and then all of a sudden you start to develop symptoms when you have AIDS. And you have AIDS when you have a CD4 count. CD4 are your um, T cells or your immune system. Okay? For an average individual, 500 to 1200 is what your optimal levels are for, for your immune system. HIV or AIDS is a diagnosis when it's 200 or below or you get an opportunistic infection. And an opportunistic infection is an infection you wouldn't normally get if you had a healthy functioning immune system, okay? And so what happened in the early 80s is that these men were going into the emergency room with opportunistic infections that they did not see in, or had not seen in people before or, or healthy people. And so that's when they realized something was going on and they were checking CD4 counts and people had CD4 counts of zero or one or two. Their immune systems were completely entirely wiped out. All right, so if you get to this point, if you get to an AIDS diagnosis, you have about three years before you would die, or about a year if you have been diagnosed with an opportunistic infection, if you're not on treatment. All of these are if you're not on treatment. We have anti-retrovirals, anti -retro ARVs, easier to say, that are very effective at keeping the virus from replicating and keeping it almost undetectable. And so people can live long, healthy lives, okay? But this is if you didn't know what your status was. So keep that in mind as well. Okay, this is where we get audience participation. Yes? I have a question about the Sure. So you were talking about the treatments for AIDS. 
Yes. Are those treatments effective once you have both lung symptoms, or is it that it has to be administered prior to that? Good question. So again, I didn't. I don't want to talk about treatment because I'm not an MD or a DO. So that was the very qualifier that I had. Um, but you can increase your CD4 counts. Okay. So if they get you on, the ideal is they get you on medication when you're in the the latent asymptomatic phase. It keeps your CD4 counts from going any lower. If they've dropped so low, yes, they can go back up, but they never go back to what would be considered a healthy functioning immune system again. So, um, but good question. So yes, you wanna get tested early so that you know your status so you can get on the drugs and you can stay as healthy as long as possible. Only treatment question, okay, just kidding. How is HIV transmitted? Okay, so sexual transmission. Blood transfusions, hopefully not in the U.S. anymore, but you're right, it was historically, yes. Yes, needle sharing, mother to child. What have we forgotten? Did we get them all? I think we did. Okay, what? Yep, no, okay. So here are the transmission routes. So it is a blood-borne disease, right? So it's passed through blood. So either through sexual intercourse, especially anal intercourse, it could be vaginal, anal, or oral, but anal is the most risky because of the tearing of the lining. So you have blood and you have semen. That, and so we'll talk about that a little bit later when we look at some st other statistics. Semen and vaginal fluids, also um, breast milk. So this is a problem because in low resource countries, we're able to save the baby from being born HIV positive because the moms are given drugs right before childbirth. But then what happens if you don't have clean water or formula? How do you feed your baby? Breast milk, right? And so then we infect the kids. So this is still a problem that we're trying to figure out. We can save them from being born HIV positive, but then they convert shortly thereafter. And then the big one for this region, and we'll talk about in a little bit, is injection drug use, sharing needles. And I just found this statistic, which is kind of amazing to me, I hadn't seen this before. HIV can live in a used needle for up to 42 days. So HIV, the virus itself, is really hard to catch in that when it hits air, it dies. So if you have a cut and you're actively bleeding, the virus dies as soon as it hits, comes into contact with air. But if you have it in a closed environment where it can just sit there and then you share that needle with somebody else, or then they share it with somebody else who shares it with somebody else for 42 days, think how many people could use that needle. So that's frightening when we're gonna talk about what's going on here locally. And ask me, if you have questions, stop along the way. I know I, I'm gonna probably try to cover too much, but I love to talk about this stuff. Okay, so how is it not transmitted? This is the misconception area. How is it not transmitted? Sharing a cup. Thank you. Called casual contact, right? You can share a cup with someone who's HIV positive, you're not gonna get the disease. How else can you not get it? What? High five, exactly. You can give them a high five. You can give them a hug. You can give them a kiss on the cheek. Now, deep kissing is debatable. There's been a couple of cases where they think deep kissing or what we call French kissing has caused transmission, but you would have to have an actively open sore or cut in your mouth and the other person would as well and it would have to meet up perfectly, okay? So basically casual contact, you cannot get HIV. Can you get HIV from sharing a toilet seat with someone? No. no. Can you get it from? Saliva, tears, sweat, no, okay? I mean, they said you'd have to drink a gallon of saliva to get HIV, which I don't think anyone in here is ever gonna try to do. Um, this one is one of the biggest misconceptions we see when we ask people about HIV knowledge. You cannot get HIV from a mosquito, a tick, or any blood-sucking insect. It does not work that way. Don't ask me how the insect works, that part I don't know. But all I know is that you can't get it. If it has bitten someone who is HIV positive and bites you, you're not gonna get the disease. And obviously it is not airborne, thank goodness, right? It actually is a virus that is quite difficult to get, unless you're engaging in some of the behavior, unprotected sex, intravenous drug use, um, then you're at risk. Okay, so what's going on in the world? At the end of 2016, we had 36.7 million people living with HIV in the world. Why do we say people living with HIV and not people who are infected by HIV? Anybody want to take a stab at that one? Yeah. Okay. So that indicates they know their status. Good. What else? Right. 
So when you say you're infected with something, what's the first thing you think of? Oh my God, am I gonna get it? It's stigmatizing. We also don't say people who are, you know, diagnosed or you know, infected with diabetes. We say people living with diabetes. Any disease nowadays, we say living with, because people are living with it and living with it full healthy lives. And to help destigmatize it, we say living with. So we've got 36.7 people living with HIV worldwide. And 2.1 million children. Is this surprising? Ish, right? We have virtually decreased our HIV mother to child transmission in the United States almost down to zero. We do a really good job if women come into the emergency room, they come in and labor, they get tested for HIV, they can be given drugs that virtually eliminate HIV transmission to children. So we've done a really good job here in the US. But in other countries around the world, they may be able to prevent it, but like I said, for other reasons, they may then pass it on through breast milk, or they just may not be to have the uh, resources available to test babies before they're born. So we do have children who are still living with HIV. So what continent is most affected by HIV AIDS? What do you think? Africa. You think it's changed in the past 30 years? No, sadly it has not. But they even break it down more than just Africa. They break it down to part of Africa, okay? So we used to say just Sub-Saharan Africa. That was it, they were the most affected. We now say it's Eastern and Southern Africa is most affected, okay? Almost half of the, or just over half the cases. Then the next, where do you think the second most affected region is? Yeah, Central and Western. So it makes up Sub-Saharan. Okay, then comes Asia and comes some others. But I want you to look at some of these numbers. 7% adult prevalence. Anyone have any idea what the US high prevalent cities percentages of HIV are? Atlanta, New York, what? Oh, okay. Like, what do you think the percentage might be for what we would consider a high prevalent city in the United States? What? 3%? 1%. So we consider above 1% to be high prevalence in the United States. And so these are 7% adult HIV prevalence. So they're still living with many more cases than we are here in the United States. All right, so looking at just some of those numbers. Also, we have to work on this. We don't have enough people on antiretrovirals or the ARVs. 60% is good, but we can do better, because like I said, it takes the viral load down to undetectable. So if you are engaging in unprotected sex, your chance of passing it to someone else is virtually the same as anyone who doesn't have HIV. So we need people on ARVs, and it keeps you alive much longer. And then children, 50%, obviously not good enough either. We need many more on ARVs. So what do you think's happening here? Are we doing better than we were 10 years ago? Maybe, think it's gone up? Okay. So in the US, my dad, this is my dad by the way. I should have pointed out my family's down here in this corner. Um, okay, so my dad said there are more cases than 10 years ago. Anyone else have another opinion? New cases, I should say, new cases. Okay, so actually, the good news is, we're doing better. So in public health speak, we call new cases what? Incidents. Incidents, okay, thank you public health people. Um, incidents is the fancy word in public health if you hear it on the news for number of new cases in any given period of time. CDC usually looks at HIV over the co course of a year, so we look at statistics based on new cases per year. Prevalence is then what? How is that different than incidence? <laughs> exactly, so these are existing cases. So then each year they just keep added together, okay? So if you look at these numbers here, you can see we're doing better. There was an 18% drop from 2008 to 2014, all right? So we're doing better. And there's a little bit of an uptake here, but before 2008, we used to think of around uh, 50,000 new cases a year. So we're doing better than we were, but we can do better, all right? But, here's the big but. In 2015, we had 1.2 million Americans living with HIV, but 15% of them did not know they were positive. Why is this a problem? Right, so they're responsible for infecting 40% of the new cases that year. So 
everybody, it's imperative that you know your status and get tested each year, right? If you're having new sexual partners or having unprotected sex, get tested, know your status, because there are a lot of people out there, and you may think, I don't have HIV, I don't have to worry, but what about these other 15% that have it, and you could be having sex with them, right? So you wanna make sure that you're protecting yourself. Okay, so sub-affected, this is looking at sexual behavior. The yellow are the men and the blue are the women. The top are all male-to-male -male sexual contacts, so men who have sex with men. So what do you see about that? Who's our most affected subgroups in 2016? Men who are having sex with men in black, Hispanic, and white, the top three right there. This is all heterosexual transmission right here, and you can see the numbers are lower. So why do you think that's the case? Why do we have more cases of HIV among men who have sex with men? in the United States. Okay, so they don't want to get tested. They may not want to access services. What else? What about the behavior of, yeah? So, yes, so absolutely. Anal sex is the riskiest of sexual behavior for HIV transmission. And not because I'm stigmatizing the behavior, it just actually is, right? So the anus has a skin in it that can be torn very easily and then when ejaculation occurs, semen gets in through the cracks, okay? So anal sex is the riskiest. And in the United States, these males are young males. They didn't live, live through the epidemic in the early 80s where they saw people dying in huge numbers. In fact, entire um, populations of friends were all dying of HIV. They didn't see that, they didn't witness that. So they're just assuming, well, there's, you know, there's drugs for that now, I can live with HIV. So they're still not taking precaution necessarily and using condoms like they should be. All right, so there's still, there's a major uptick in the number of HIV cases among men who have sex with men. This is just looking at it in a different way. Heterosexual, 23%. Among gay and bisexual men, 70% of the new cases and they only account for 4% of the population. So there's obviously a major disconnect here. Now look at this little tiny line, 7%. That's among people who are injecting drugs. Seem, seems pretty small, right? 7% of the new cases. It is fairly small, right? Among injection drug users. This was in 2014, but what is happening now? So this is looking at the number of people 2015 a year later. Still not that many difference here between the number of people from injection drug use. But what's going on now? Heroin and heroin use. Heroin is off the charts. Why are we switching, why are drug users choosing, her, or drug users choosing heroin now? Anybody know? Right, so people were addicted to the prescription opioids, right, Oxycod oxycodone, um, some of those, and it got too expensive and there's too many Restrictions now, it's hard to get the pills. So they've switched to heroin. How's heroin injected, right? Couldn't figure out another way to say that. How do you ingest it, I guess? You inject it. And what can happen when you inject drugs? You share needles and you put yourself at risk for HIV, right? So this 286% increase is from 2002 to 2013. I guarantee if we saw numbers to 2018, it would be double that right now. The heroin use is off the charts. All right, so tuck that in the back of your mind. Let's talk about Appalachia. What's going on? How is drug use affecting Appalachia? What do you think? Heroin? Okay, first of all, let's look at Appalachia. Does everyone in this room know that Ohio University is located in Appalachia? Yes. Okay, does anyone not know that? Because now you do. You can't graduate from Ohio University without knowing that. For those of you who don't know, Appalachia is from southern New York State all the way down to Mississippi. It includes all of West Virginia and parts of 12 other states, including Ohio, of which I did not know when I came to interview here. Okay. They asked me, why do you want to come to Ohio from Georgia? And I said, I want to get closer to home, back to the Midwest. I'm from Indiana. And one of our faculty members looked at me and said, this is not the Midwest. This is Appalachia. And I went, it is? I, I had looked for everything and prepared for my interview. I ran back to the hotel that night and sure enough, oh my gosh, Ohio has Appalachia, who knew? Okay, so here, where are we up here? We're right here. We're in the south, what are we, the nor north central, north central of Appalachia. 420 counties at this time in Appalachia. All right, so now, keep that map in your head. 
we're gonna look at this. This is overdose deaths in 2014. You can see where they're concentrated, right? Appalachian region, and of course sprinkled around the, to the, the coast as well. But certainly a lot of death, overdose death here in the Appalachian region. It's actually worse. The most recent data, this yeah. area is the worst in the entire country. Yeah, it is. It's, it's really bad and we have some of the highest overdose rates. And normally when we look at any chronic disease, we're always the worst in Appalachia, right? You've probably seen this slide in obesity and diabetes. I mean, we're the worst of the worst on everything. All right, so, so now look at this map. So this is HIV diagnoses. What do you see in the same region with the darkest number is the, the most amount of diagnoses? We don't have it, right? What's going on? This is like literally the only disease I ever talk about where the Appalachian region is better than the rest. I mean, there is some here in the southern Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia area, but the rest of that Kentucky, West Virginia, Ohio, where we can always see high poverty and high disease, it's not there. So what's going on? So historically, we've had very low rates of HIV in Appalachia, 57% lower than the rest of the nation. Southern states, like I just mentioned, have the highest rates in Appalachia. Southern um, states in urban Appalachian areas are twice as likely to have HIV cases than the rural areas. But this is the one that really surprises me because I do a lot in Appalachia and I've, I've done so many presentations about Appalachia that the distressed and the non-distressed counties, anyone know what the difference is between those? What that means? A distressed county in Appalachia? They're the worst of the worst for unemployment, educational attainment, and poverty. Okay, and we're all given a score. Athens just climbed out to the next one up. Um, so, and that took me 11 years, but we got there. Um, whereas the non-distressed counties are just like the rest of the United States. Normally we see it, right, that the worst of the worst is always in the distressed counties. Not for HIV, it's the, it's the reverse. And we, so the people in the poorer counties are less likely to have HIV than those in the non-distressed counties. Why? Yeah, have, why? We have a couple theories. Okay. So, or, hypotheses, but um, go ahead. <laughs> That's so okay. Rural regions in general are more likely to be um, religious, conservative leaning. Okay. So there's likely to be less men who have sex with men, which are at the highest risk. Okay. Are there, are there less men who are having sex with men, or are there less oh. people who are identifying as? Maybe. I'm not sure. Okay. That's why I said theory. And then also, is it that there's fewer cases or there's fewer reports? Okay. Fewer cases of HIV and fewer reporting. That's also, so, you have to get tested. Yeah. yeah. So, like, if you're not getting tested, we don't really, so it's like, so we may have a lower sure. rate, but I don't know that it's actually. That's, and, and that's a good point. Obviously, to get these numbers, we have to have people going in to get tested. So, there has to be testing going on, and we know in the rural areas, Testing is very difficult. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute because we have low access. Is it that people are having less sex? Probably not, right? No, no. Yeah, yeah. So there probably are people who are having sex with men. It's just probably not known, right? Yeah. Or you don't identify as such if you are. Okay. But good. I like those. I like that line of thinking. And I'll be honest, we don't necessarily know all the answers here. So the more you can help, the better. Couple t a couple studies that were done. Havens is down in Kentucky. And she did a study in 2013. She looked at social networks, actually really cool. It was a longitudinal study and they looked at over the course of two years, intravenous drug users and whether or not they converted to HCV or HIV during the two years. Okay, 55% HCV infection at the end of two years. How many HIV cases do you think there were? Oh, sorry, hepatitis C. Hepatitis C. But how many HIV among intravenous drug users do you think there were at the end of two-year study? How many converted or became positive? Zero. Zero. So then we did a study here in Athens County among drug users. Most of them were intravenous drug users. And we did an educational intervention, tell them how HIV is transmitted in hopes of getting them tested right there on the spot and all of them got tested but one. What do you think the HIV rate was in that group? Zero. So I was talking to 
um, Jennifer at a conference and I'm like, what, what's going on in Appalachia? Why are there no HIV cases? The two of us were like, I don't know. Maybe there's something going on genetically that these people are predisposed not to get HIV. We really had no idea what's going on. Is that the case? Is it the case that there's something that is a protective factor here in rural Appalachia? What do you think? No, 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 no. It just hasn't been introduced, okay? So there were people who talked about it. Well, maybe there's really something going on there. No, it just hasn't been introduced. So what's going on in Ohio? You guys all want to know. Let's look first at this. This is unintentional drug overdose in Ohio from 2011 to 2016. The worst are in the darkest blue and they're from 21 to 42. Um, 42, I think that is on there. Athens is at 18.4, okay, per 100,000. So we're in the middle. Certainly the south, southwest is, has higher rates of overdose, but still really high rates, okay? And you are right, we are the worst in Ohio sadly, or the best, however you want to look at this, but we do have the highest overdose rate in the nation. Now, we keep trading with West Virginia based on whether they just do straight cases or percentage of population, but it's bad. All right, so we have high overdose in Ohio. So, what are the consequences of drug use besides overdose? Well, I mean, there's lots of consequences. We're thinking Addiction, yeah. We're thinking disease-wise, infectious disease-wise. Hep C, right? So what do you think's going on in Athens County related to hepatitis C? Skyrocketing. I mean, like, scary skyrocketing. Okay, so I wrote a grant last year to, to look at doing um, needle exchange here. It was an NIH grant. And when I saw the hepatitis C rates, I couldn't believe it. Okay, so in 2011, 38.8 .8 per 100,000 people, and now in 2016, 233.7 per 100,000. And so we call HCV, what do we call it in public health talk, for those of you who know public health, what do we call HIV, HCV for HIV? It's a surrogate marker, okay? A surrogate marker is something where it has the same type of transmission, so we know that if one's increasing, the other one's probably gonna increase, all right? So when I wrote my grant, I couldn't say we had HIV rates that were increasing, because we didn't. But we could show these numbers and say, I didn't get the grant, sadly, but um, we could say, you know, it's just a matter of time. One person introduces it, and those numbers are gonna go off the charts. Okay, HCV is transmitted by blood, semen, vaginal fluid, and intravenous drug use. Looks pretty similar, right? To HIV. So that's what I just said. If there's an increase in HCV, we're likely to see this increase in HIV. So do you think it's happening in other places that are similar to Athens? Yes. So I have been telling people since I moved here in 2006, HIV is coming. It's just a matter of time. And people are like, gosh, she is so crazy. Like, there is no HIV in Appalachia. It's not coming. Relax. I said, look, we're switching to heroin. It's just a matter of time. My colleagues know that I've said this for years. And unfortunately, I was right. So in 2005, we saw an outbreak in rural southern Indiana. It's not Appalachia, but the demographics are just the same. Town of 4,000 people, and they had almost 200 HIV cases. And why did they have an outbreak? Intravenous drug use and no needle exchange, because Mike Pence was the governor and he made that illegal for the state of Indiana. So, CDC went, huh, I wonder if there's other places in the United States that are ripe for HCV and HIV infection. This report came out in December 2006 in the Journal of AIDS and it said there's 220 counties that they think are ripe for HCV and HIV infection based on pharmacy sales, prescription painkillers, overdose deaths, poverty, unemployment rates, you name it, there are a bunch of factors. These were the number of counties in West Virginia, Kentucky, and Ohio, most of them in Appalachia. Over half of the 220 counties were in Appalachia, okay? So, now what do you think has happened since this report? Have there been more outbreaks? Yep. So just recently in West Virginia, this was just last year in November 2017, they saw in 15 counties, they saw 16 total cases by the end of October. Normally they don't see 60 cases all year in those 15 counties. 
Again, those 15 counties, none of them had a needle exchange program. And another one just more recently in Northern Kentucky, right? 37 cases that usually see in, a, in two counties that usually see three to four total per year. And again, no needle exchange. So what can we do? What do we do? Needle exchange, okay. So needle exchange has been around for a long time. Anybody know where it started or was shown to be most effective? Years ago, not here in the United States. Anybody? <laughs> Europe, right? Amsterdam. Okay, so Amsterdam was brilliant in taking their, I mean, they have legalized prostitution and drug use, and they took their HIV and said, you're not coming here. We're gonna just start from the beginning testing people and giving away needles and exchanging needles. And they have no, I mean, they virtually have no HIV in Amsterdam. So we compiled all this data. I wrote a great paper on it in my PhD program, which would have been, what, 15 years ago, about all the evidence for needle exchange programs. And yet, do we have them widely in the United States? No. Because why? Because people say that you're encouraging the behavior. Right. But it's our job to judge. It's our job to make people say that they're going to do the activity anyway. Exactly. So the public health perspective, we don't judge people. We don't say, oh my gosh, that's horrible that you're doing drugs. Yes, we're going to give you options to, if you want to quit but we're gonna try and make it safer so that you don't get HIV or HCV or transmit it to somebody else, right? We'd rather give you clean noodles to use. That's the public health perspective. We don't stigmatize, we don't judge. We wanna just keep people healthier, all right? So that is one of the problems is that people see that if we're funding this behavior, we're encouraging people to do drugs. And that's not necessarily the case. They're gonna find a way to do the drugs anyway, right? They're gonna go pick. Yeah, they're gonna go pick up dirty needles, they're gonna do whatever they need to do, and they're gonna put themselves at risk and other people are at risk. And not just from sharing needles, then they have unprotected sex and um, transmission obviously occurs. So one of the best things that we can do is needle exchange. And I'm not gonna show this because I know we wanna have some time for discussion, but you can Google it if you want to see what Southern Indiana responded by having a needle exchange program and they were able to kind of squelch their epidemic. Um, it did take encouraging from CDC to basically tell Mike Pence at the time, you have to do this. <laughs> and he did. All right. Needle exchange works. We now have one here in Athens County. Anybody know where it is in Athens County? It's in Gloucester. Um, it started almost a year ago, and it was a little slow to get started because I think it was near one of the, either the sheriff's office or something there, and people were very hesitant to go bring dirty needle paraphernalia where you could be arrested for being on, you know, having drugs with you. Um, they've since moved it, and it's been better attended. But basically, it's not, it's privately funded with donations um, so that they have, I think it, $4,500 a year to buy needles that they can then give to people as they come and exchange the dirty needles. So it's good, we have it, we know it works. The other thing you need to do is get tested. This used to be really hard in Athens County, that's why I did that testing study a few years ago. It used to be the only place you could get tested in Athens County was at Planned Parenthood with very limited hours and a lot of men don't feel necessarily comfortable going into Planned Parenthood at your private physician's office and here on campus and that was it. But if you're a community member, you didn't have a whole lot of options, especially if you didn't have access to a private doctor. So we're actually really lucky that we now have the Athens Health Department is doing HIV testing, Planned Parenthood, private doctor, campus care. I know they lost their funding grant to do it for a little while, but is it back maybe? HIV testing here on campus. And now we have at-home self-testing. So this is really cool. This is not a pregnancy test, I know. Uh, it is an HIV test called OraQuick. For about $40, you can go to Walmart, you can go to CVS, you can go to Fruth. Most of the time it's in the pharmacy, you have to go back and ask for one, but it is very easy to use. Our testing study was actually a feasibility testing this among the rural IDU, intravenous drug us users to see if they felt comfortable using this by themselves, could follow the instructions and determine if they were positive or negative. And almost all of them, 96% of them said they really liked it and they would go buy it if they needed to, to be able to test themselves at home. So you basically just swab your mouth, put it in some solution, and in 20 minutes, you know if you're HIV positive or not. Now if you're positive, you have to go in for future testing, but um, it is nice that you can do this now at home. Okay, so the bottom line, still almost 40 years later, we're still talking about HIV. People thought that this was gonna have been cured a long time ago but it's preventable, right? There are a lot of things we can't prevent, but this is one you can. If you are using needles to inject 
heroin or something and the like, please use clean needles and go to a needle exchange if you can't afford them on your own. And if you're having sex, use a condom. You may think and know you're clean, but you have no idea about the history of the person you're engaging in sexual behavior with and who they've had sex with. So you have unprotected sex with one person, you have sex with their entire sexual past. And that can be hundreds of people, depending on the person, okay? And condoms are available everywhere, but you have to plan ahead a little bit, all right? So make sure you always have one with you, men and women, all right? Don't assume it's the guy's responsibility to have a condom. Protect yourself. We obviously need more, that's to say addiction treatment programs and education about HIV, HCV. We're failing everybody and sexual health in general, but especially about HIV and HCV prevention. All right, so now that you all know this, I want you to go out and at least tell one more person about all of this, right? Because HIV is coming, it's gonna come, it's gonna in infiltrate, maybe not here in Athens County, but somewhere nearby, and I don't want any of you to be affected by it, all right, or the people that you know and love. So with that, last thing I wanna say is, we do have the Reproductive and Sexual Health Initiative. One of my colleagues, Dr. Caroline Kingori, is over there. We started this in 2016 because there are a few of us doing similar work on campus, and we wanted to get other faculty but students involved as well who are interested in sexual health. So the mission is really to advance the field of reproductive and sexual health here at, by fostering interdisciplinary research. Um, through community outreach, education, and scholarly activities in collaboration with academic partners and community-based organizations from around the world. Um, and certainly one of our core values is to train the next generation. So if you're interested as students and want to get involved, send me an email, bostedohio.edu, and we certainly can plug you into a meeting and maybe get you involved in some of the different research that we do have going on here, not just in Athens, but also worldwide. So, so let me know if you're interested. And with that, I will take some questions. Yeah, questions. Okay, I guess I can put that back up there. Selling needles. Um, okay, so the question was about selling needles. So people are getting them, I'm, I'm assuming, through like diabetes, they're having prescriptions for them, actually going to get them legally and then turning to sell them. Yeah, and there's like, I saw in Columbus that there's like a needle exchange where people are picking up needles and saying, it was like Oh, they're picking them up at needle exchange yeah. and then selling them. So unfortunately, you know, when you are that desperate, you are going to do anything yeah. to get money. And so, you know, you can only police it so much. You hope that when you're giving them the needles, they're going to use them themselves. Same thing when we pass out condoms, we hope that people are going to use them. Um, but it, that would be hard to, to police, yeah. It's kind of like food stamps and people selling those. It's hard to police it, but um, yeah, sad but true. Good question though. I don't have an answer. Anyone else have an answer for that? Yeah, that's a tough one. Other questions or comments? Yeah. Ooh, good question. Uh, question is about who's the new CDC director and what he's gonna do for HIV prevention. Um, so here's my non-political political response. So we know historically that anytime there's a Republican in office, they tend to pretty much cut prevention like this across the board. Um, health education, health prevention are the first things to go. Of course, I think they're probably one of the most important things we can invest in. Um, and so chances are very little money is gonna be put there. I don't know exactly what they're gonna do, but my guess is it'll be certainly less than with the previous administration. That's my guess. Usually when we have Democrats in power, we get more money put into CDC and prevention, but it just depends who's in office as to what we're gonna do, but I don't know, good question. Other questions, comments, yeah. Um, so recently California like, uh, changed their law that made it a felony to knowingly transmit HIV to someone. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about those issues? Ooh, those, good those question. Okay, so the question was about knowingly transmitting HIV to someone. So um, there are laws in certain states that do take this into account. Um, they're hard to 
to prosecute and prove that the person knowingly infected somebody else. Um, I didn't know that California had passed that as a law, so um, they, just they just did that. Like decriminalized. Okay, so they decriminalized. Yeah. So you. So, yeah. So the the argument was that that people who wanted to decriminalize it were saying that the only way someone could prove right. that they didn't knowingly infect someone is to never get tested. So that the right. result of criminalizing HIV transmission would be that people would not get tested. Sure. Okay. So they did the reverse. They made it so that you can't be cr criminally prosecuted for what you would think is accusing someone of knowingly transmitting HIV. Okay, good. I was a little bit concerned by that. So the criminalization obviously adds to the stigma, right, and the stigmatization of HIV if then we say, oh, no, this person is knowingly giving. Because, again, exactly, it would be very hard to prove that unless you know the person never knew their status or did know their status. They did get tested. They didn't get tested. So um, most people think that it should not be, in the HIV world, think it should not be criminalized. But there have been cases over the years um, that have tried to, for somebody they say absolutely knew they were HIV positive, told people they were HIV positive, and then had sex with people, or bit people, that's been another one, or um, trying to infect people at gas station pumps with a needle, those sorts of things, those have all happened. I don't know the results, though, of the cases. That's not something I necessarily know if they've won those or not, but certainly those cases have been around. Did that answer your question, sort of? Yeah. Ish? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would say I'm on the HIV community, and Dr. Kangori, before you leave, am I, I don't know, you know, all of this. I would say from the HIV community, most people don't want it to be criminalized, right, because that impedes on them going to get tested and knowing your status, so, um, yeah. The debate can be on both sides, depending on where you are and what, what your beliefs are, but, yes, yes. It gets tested. Yeah. It's all tested. So, in fact, if, if you, oh, I'm sorry. Um, are there are concerns about HIV being back in the blood supply in the U.S. It's all tested now, so that is not a concern. So, okay. Yes. Yes. You will get your HIV status if you donate blood. They will, they will give it to you. Um, for anyone here who hasn't donated blood, yes, you are tested, and they will, they will tell you your status, and you will certainly be notified if you're positive, for sure. Good question, though. Other questions? Yeah. What are the most uh, like, popular causes of HIV? The most, the mo one that has the most amount of transmission? It depends where you live in the world. So in Africa, it's, you're not going to want to hear this from me, but um, it's when a man and a woman have sexual relations. I know this is my son, so he, that probably just <laughs> killed him to hear that. Although he's heard that word a lot from me, so and it's not that. Um, but here in the United States, it's from men who have sex with men. But good question. <laughs> Thanks for asking. And he gets a t-shirt, okay. Good job, Liam. Uh, yeah, all right, other questions? About HIV? Yes? I just wanted to say on the issue of blood donation yeah. because sexually active gay men yes, are they're not allowed. prevented from donating blood even yep. if they're HIV negative. And then that Good point. So, one, one of the issues, and this is also debated both ways, um, is whether or not men who have sex with men should be able to donate blood. So currently, they are not. If they've ever had sex with a man there, they are not allowed to even donate. So that is a problem in and of itself, and a lot of us that are, who are HIV researchers support that you should be able to donate blood. If you're, not, if you're not positive, you should be able to donate blood. So it shouldn't matter what your sexual behavior or sexual orientation is. So I know they're working on it. I think Canada has made it so it's possible for men who have sex with men to donate blood, and I'm hoping the U.S. eventually follows suit, yeah. Yes, mom. Needle exchange program. 
Yes. Where is the responsibility? In other words, does it have to be like a university doing it? Is it county? Is it state, city, or just organizations? I mean, what's the... It's a good question. So questions on needle exchange. So no federal money can go to buy needles for a needle exchange program. So federal money, you can write a grant to the NIH and they can pay for everything else. They can pay for the van to go, they can pay for the, um, the staff support, they can pay for the Sharps container boxes, but it can't pay for the needles. Don't get me started on that one. It was really fun actually writing the grant for needle exchange when needle exchange was one of the things they wanted to fund, but you had to find another way in there to fund the needle exchange because obviously the federal government won't pay for the needles. So you have to get those through private donations, um, CVS, some of the other pharma, um, pharmacies in Athens I think are the ones who are donating the needles for the Athens needle exchange, um, but private foundation money, all of that has to be used for purchasing the actual needles. Statewide, no, but it is legal in Ohio. So we do have programs in Cleveland, Portsmouth. Um, there's maybe 10 different programs. Cincinnati now has one. Um, there, there, I think maybe around 10, where a couple years ago there were only two, one in Portsmouth and one in Cleveland. Yeah. So let's just say that you've inspired somebody to actually be HIV tested today. Yeah. And they find out that they are HIV positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you want to get tested for HIV, and luckily you can get tested here in Athens, um, you can get tested with the home kit if you wanted to. If you do with the home kit and you get an initial positive result, you need to follow up with your doctor and they're going to test you again. And then they're likely going to test you again. So they probably do a quick oral one just like that, but then they're going to do a confirmatory blood to make sure you are indeed um, positive. If you go to anywhere for testing, there's anonymous and confidential testing. So anonymous is you're given a number and you call back and you get your results with the number if you have to wait. Nowadays they can do them as rapid tests, so sometimes you can just wait right there. Um, whereas confidential, they do have your name and it is name-based. Um, some people don't want that. They don't want, want your name attached to it. It depends on where you go. I think Planned, Par Planned Parenthood offers anonymous testing. I don't know what Campus Care does. But then they will follow up with you. You'll get counseling done regardless. So they do post-test counseling. If you're negative, they're going to be like, that's great. Let's continue you know, using condoms and preventing yourself from becoming positive. If you're positive, they're going to then refer you for HIV services. We do not have an infectious disease doc here in Athens. So someone, I think, does drive in once a week. But most people have to end up going to Columbus. Lancaster or Parkersburg to get their services. And a lot of people want to do that for the stigma. They also want to be outside of Athens so people don't know that they're going to the infectious disease doc. So, but there are lots of services out there. If you can't afford or you don't have insurance, the Ryan White Care Act was developed based on Ryan White, who was a young child who had hemophilia, died in, um, in Indiana, actually went to school near where I went to school when I was growing up. So, um, his entire, the funding for, is devoted to low-income individuals who can't afford care, housing, transportation, all of it, opens doors for people who are HIV positive who otherwise wouldn't be able to get those services. And it, it's usually refunded every so many years, and I don't see that'll be ending anytime soon. So there are services available. And it's not a death sentence anymore. Most important thing, you can live healthy, long lives. When I worked in Atlanta, I saw people in, in, that had CD4 counts of 0, 1, 2, 3 um, when I was working in a mental health clinic there for people who are positive. And nowadays, um, you know, people can live 30, 40, 50, 60 years just like a regular healthy life um, as long as they're on their ARV medication. Okay, it's, so it's not this huge problem, but what about cost? When you start yeah, cost is huge. What do you think the medication costs per month in the United States for HIV medication? It's $3,000 a month. So we do have medication assistance through the Ryan White Care Act if people can't afford it or don't have insurance. Um, but that's a lot of money. And then you're also having to follow up with going to your infectious disease doc and you may be having to drive to Columbus. And so there's a lot of other factors and things that add up. It is not a good idea to just say, there's a drug for that, I don't need to worry about preventing it, right? That's never usually a good idea for most things, but certainly not for this because it really is, a, it's a huge cost, an economic burden 
if you don't have insurance, if you're HIV positive. Yes? When you have HIV, does it, does it look like you're sick? That's a good question. So no. For, oh, sorry. Um, if you have HIV, would someone know it by looking at you? No, the answer is no. For the first 10 years of infection, you're asymptomatic. We all, nobody would know in this room. Um, and so that's the part of why you have to protect yourself. Now, once you have AIDS, for those of you who have watched, you know, and the band plays on and some of those other, or have seen people who have died of AIDS, you know the emaciated look and, and the, um, some of the cancers that may appear on the skin, the lesions that you wouldn't normally have. But until that point, no, you look and act healthy like other people. So, good question. Yes, Adrian. Uh, follow up on Natalie's question. Yeah. Do most insurance plans cover HIV beds, or is the stigma too great? No, most insurance plans do cover HIV. Most insurance co um, companies do cover HIV meds. The question was about coverage. Yes. Because otherwise, the consequences are going to cost a lot more of having to take care of someone who then has AIDS. So, but yes, very expensive all around. How are we doing? Any, any question, um, another question, comment, last one, anybody? Anybody not get a t-shirt that wants a t-shirt? Last chance. Yes. Good question about law enforcement and needle exchange. Um, so we hope in most places you have a good relationship with the sheriff's office or whoever the, the police are in that area. Most police are very, I, I wouldn't say most, there are a lot of police officers that if you talk to them ahead of time and you let them know what's going on, that this is needle exchange, they're going to understand the importance of it and let it happen. There are others that are going to find out about it and they're going to go arrest everyone that goes there. And so some places have had to actually move locations. They're on like secret texts or whatever, like, hey, we're going to meet at 6 a.m. in this parking lot so that the police are not on to where they're going. Um, for needle exchange. But it seems like, at least the one here in Athens, after they kind of talked to the folks and let them know what was going on, that they turn kind of a blind eye to the folks coming to, to get needles. So, but technically, any of them could be arrested because there is going to be trace illegal drugs in their paraphernalia. Yeah. Good question. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Uh, next week. Morgan Viss, it's all about algae next week. So algae. Come and check it out. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thanks so much.